Um, so as Paul said, I'm Gabrielle Thomas and I joined the team here in Durham as part of the Catholic Studies Centre, which is very exciting. As an Anglican, I have to say, I'm learning an awful lot. And we are embodying, I think, receptive ecumenism currently in our team, which is fantastic. Um, my research here focuses on the experiences of women in UK churches. Uh, it's a research project running in collaboration with the National Board of Catholic Women. And uh, we're learning a lot, some of it's positive, and as you probably won't be surprised to know, some of it's a little challenging women's experiences in church. So, we begin this morning with our second academic panel, which is focusing upon language, gender, and the church. A subject which you will appreciate is not at all controversial, and very simple to resolve in one morning's conversations. Our panel consists of three Catholic theologians who have extensively engaged with how we speak and think about gender in relation to the church and, of course, in relation to God. So we have the opportunity to join them this morning on a rich journey of discovery. So please join me in welcoming Professor Janet Soskis, Professor Gerard Loughlin and Reverend Dr James Allison. We're all looking forward to your papers and we're very grateful that you're here with us to share this morning. So the session will run as yesterday's panel and each speaker will speak for 20 minutes, was it yesterday? I think a little over, um, possibly with some of the speakers. So um, we might be a little over again today, but 20 to 25 minutes for each paper. And then after that I'll give you a chance to stand up and stretch and there will be an opportunity to then think about questions and uh, challenge the kind of what they've provided for us to think about. So if I can invite Professor Janet Skoskis to give her paper first. Janet is Professor of Philosophical Theology at the University of Cambridge <laughs> and a Fellow of Jesus College. She's written a widely uh, influential books, including Metaphor and Religious Language and The Kindness of God. And her sisters of Sinai, How Two Lady Adventurers Discovered the Lost Gospels, was Book of the Week on Radio 4. And she's asked me not to give quite such a long introduction as um, one might be able to give for someone who has accomplished quite so much. So I'll simply say that her paper is entitled this morning, Beyond the Brotherhood of Man, Scripture, Language and the Church. Thank you. So it's wonderful to be here um, celebrating the 10th anniversary of the, the Centre and uh, it's a great encouragement to us all and to <coughs> participate in this panel on language, gender and the church uh, topic devised to sweep up a number of searching questions and in my own case I have drawn a long-term interest in religious language. Um, all those questions of he's and she's and other things, that's not the only question about religious language. Names of God. Because indeed as you know, inclusive language debates have been with us for a long time in the public arena. And my own return to thinking about this prior to the invitation here was an invitation last year to address the European Society for Catholic Theology, organized by uh, the theologians from Strasbourg. And the French organizer was very insistent. Um, I was just the person she wanted. She told me it was going to be a wonderful conference on a theme which united us all, and especially since the theme, the conference was to be held in the home of the European Parliament, Strasbourg, and the theme was fraternity. <laughs> I, I read her email, I think her initial approach was by email, with a degree of quiet desperation. I wrote back to point out that fraternity would be an unlikely topic for a theological conference in the English-speaking world today. To organize a conference around brotherhood would almost immediately transgress accepted practice with respect to gender-inclusive and gender-exclusive language. That all official documents in English-speaking countries, whether government, university or business use inclusive language. An American politician even who campaigned on the brotherhood of man and the fatherhood of God, as in days gone by, would risk electoral suicide. 
but perhaps not, given what we've seen. Um, <laughs> in fact, the only place, the only, only place that I hear exclusive language is at the Mass, where week by week we pray for us men and for our salvation. Of course, in the rest of the Mass, where I go, inclusive language is used. But it, of course, one of the uh, inadvertent complexities of translating, going from the Latin to the vernacular, is vernacular languages change, normal natural languages change, and non-exclusive languages become unacceptable in almost every place in Britain except for the Catholic Church. Um, and of course, uh, most people try to accommodate where they can. So, continuing my exchange with the organizer from Strasbourg, I mentioned that I'd written on God's fatherhood, and that brotherhood was a dependent term, and that was enough for the desperate organizer, the jaws clamped, and she said, that's fine, you're just the person, etc. Um, and so I uh, thought, great, here it comes, a UK theologian, because the speakers have chosen to represent different uh, nations. I'm the first UK theologian in the first conference after Brexit, and I'm going to come in and have to trash the central theme of brotherhood. <laughs> 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 But as the time came closer, I warmed my topic. I didn't want to drag other nations and linguistic groups into the torments of the English language speaker, but reflecting on it, I could see that we have not just fractious disagreement, but exciting new avenues for Christian theology that came out of these debates. And so that's some of what I want to speak to in my topic, beyond the brotherhood of man, scripture, language, and the church. In particular, something important comes from attending to the revolutionary power of scripture. Someone yesterday mentioned how scripture and tradition can both be revolutionary when attended to closely. Revolutionary power of terms have been neglected because precisely they're hiding in broad daylight. Brother is one and father is another. And I'm going to begin with father. Um, now, you might say God's fatherhood is scarcely neglected, we pray it every day, and so certainly that's the case. And, however, and undoubtedly in the past 30 years, the title of father has been challenged. It was one of the first places feminist theology hit the ground, particularly languages of father and son, and their centrality to scripture and liturgy. When these debates first became vivid, now over 30 years ago, when I was teaching at an Anglican theological college, I found myself extremely sympathetic to the anguish felt by women and men, but cautious as a philosopher of language about some of the proposed solutions to the Bible's gendered language, particularly when it comes to kinship terms. We can't really, without textual irresponsibility, go to the New Testament and replace every reference to God as father with mother, or supplement every reference to son and brother with daughter and sister. A, a good example is um, in the Epistle to the Hebrews 12, where the faithful are told that you have come to Mount Zion and the city of the living God with the whole church of firstborn sons, firstborn sons, enrolled as citizens of heaven. Now notice the term firstborn sons is already a contradiction in terms. You can't have more than one firstborn son. The whole church of firstborn sons enrolled as citizens of heaven. You can't really change firstborn sons to firstborn daughters, or even, I think, to firstborn children. Because the metaphor uh, depends on the notion, which was standard at the time of writing, that the firstborn son is the son of privilege and the heir to the father. And the audacity of the text, its revolutionary power, comes from the fact that absurdly, it is all the named faithful who are named the firstborn sons, and including presumably all women. For a long time, as you know, it was thought that uh, Hebrews might have been written by a husband and wife team, Priscilla and Aquila. All are to occupy, all Christians are to occupy this privileged status of the firstborn son. All Christians. And do so in the wider theology of this epistle and most of the New Testament because they are one with the firstborn son, who is Jesus Christ. Now, there are many divine names rock, wisdom, light, tower. But the debates over inclusive language brought to our attention the forgetfulness of a particular <coughs> intimate register of scriptural names, father, brother, son. These are all kinship titles and should be rare and strange to us, yet, as I've suggested, become stripped of the power to shock by their very familiarity of use. 
And it was when I was writing about these gentle names of God in, in the book that became The Kindness of God, that I became aware that the biblical authors use so many gendered terms, not because they're interested in sex, but because they're very interested in kinship. And kinship terms in most natural languages are gendered. Kinship titles are titles of intimacy, of blood relation. Kinship imagery is both compelled and resisted by Hebrew scriptures, compelled for reasons of intimacy, and resisted for fear of idolatry. The remarkable Song of Moses at the end of Deuteronomy not only provides one of the few instances of naming God Father in the Hebrew Bible, Old Testament, where it says, is he not your father who created you, who made and established you, but goes on immediately to follow with a graphic maternal imagery, accusing Israel of being unmindful of the rock that gave you birth. Paternal and maternal imagery collide in quick succession in a way that effectively rules out literalism. It is anachronoclastic uh, and does so uh, with the astonishing invocation of a birth-giving rock. The text both gives and takes away, for it is on the face of it preposterous that we creatures should be the kin of God. Yet there's a sense in which in the both the Old Testament and New point to nothing less. Kinship titles are mutually implying. Uh, if I am your kin, you are mine. <coughs> Once one has a brother or sister, one is a brother or sister. This is not merely a matter, a matter of emotional or domestic link. A shepherd who ceases to look after sheep is no longer a shepherd. He might become a farmer, or in David's case, a king. But kinship titles are not similarly disposable. A woman who gives birth is made a mother by the arrival of the child, and this is so formally, even if the child is taken away without her seeing it or dies within a few days. The relation of the child is formal as well as, in most cases, emotional. To claim, then, that God is our father and Christ our brother is to make a strong claim not only about God, but about ourselves, not only in theology, but in anthropology. Given this strength of implication, we should be more startled than we are by the kinship titles of the Bible. Yet, as I've said, until relatively recently, these have formed much, little more than the background music of Christianity, father, brother, being born again. We're familiar with the rubrics, we don't prick up our ears at it. It was left for later day for kinship metaphors to disturb and scandalize it, which they did over the feminist issues, and to perhaps to awaken us to promises of what we may become. Now, words and metaphors have histories of use. Most English speakers today, including in my experience, many theologians, many, many theologians, assume that the fatherhood of God is more or less a universal religious concept. Yet if you put down a dipstick in any of the world's religions, it'll turn out that mostly God, gods are fathers. This is decisively not the case. And it's not even the case if we look to it, uh, Christianity's antecedents in the religions of Israel. It's been marked out by a number of people that God is not styled as father in the Hebrew Bible Old Testament. And where God is styled as father, it's never directly invoked as prayer but always in terms of the, father, the fatherhood of God of Israel. And whereas when we turn to the New Testament, Jesus names God the Father over 170 times in the New Testament and never prays to God by any other title except in the cry of dereliction from the cross. God is designated as Father only 11 times in the Old Testament, and as I've said, never as such in prayer. Instead, in the narratives of Exodus, God is described with God of our fathers. The connection certainly exists between God and patriarchy with the Israelite family life at this time, etc. But God is, not our, uh, God is not father, but God of our fathers. And the difference, I think, is significant. It's been argued that the identification, by Paul Ricoeur, that this identification with the God of our fathers um, is established by means of historical, <coughs> historical association in the Hebrew Bible who, who God has been for the people in their journey. And in fact, there's a remarkable reservation on the part of the Israelites. The main name relation in Exodus is covenant and not kinship. It is, at best, the adoption of Israel and not their biological generation by God. Indeed, um, Rekura suggests 
that part of the reason is for this reservation not called Godfather in the ancient text is because nearby Near Eastern religions had biogenesis where the gods and goddesses were, were um, biologically generating humankind. So that from uh, um, Israelite religion uh, becomes a very idolatrous point of view. But still, nonetheless, father is a term of intimacy and it seems to be so in those few invocations which often come in the prophetic writings, for instance, Jeremiah 3, where God speaks to his faithless children in this way, I thought you would call me my father and would not turn from following me. Surely as the faithless wife leaves her husband, so you have been faithless to me, O house of Israel. So we've got, um, in this sense, a mutual contamination of kinship metaphor, where God is both a father and a spouse to, a spouse to Israel. You see the same thing going on in that Jeremiah passage, as we saw earlier with a rock that gives birth, you have a God who's a father and a spouse. And this is quite characteristic, a lot of figurative uses in the Hebrew Bible to be self-subverting in this way. So this father figure is something that even within um, the, the biblical writings that we have is not given but problematic and emerges. Because a further shock appears after only 11 designations of God as father in the Old Testament, we have this contrast of 170 times in the New Testament and on the words, uh, the mouth of Jesus. And I don't just mean using the domestic title, Abba, that's another thing. Uh, but it seems, it seems that this use of father by Jesus may have been um, central to his eschatology. Certainly there's an excellent book. We've forgotten about all this. We take fatherhood rather for granted. And all, but although the rabbis subsequently did call God father, it's unclear whether Jesus himself was the first to pioneer this usage or one of a number of teachers who are doing so at this time. We don't have any other distinctive usages like this uh, extant for us. And it was a shocking thing for the early church. Um, there's a wonderful book by Peter Whittacombe on the use of the father title in the early church. Whereas for us, it's just become like wallpaper, hasn't it? So, the same I suggest, this language of, of, of father is not obvious, and the same I want to suggest is true of sons and brothers, to get on to my beyond um, the brotherhood of man. Teresa Curry, a wonderful Nigerian New Testament scholar, has drawn our attention to a neglected feature of the commission to Mary Magdalene in John 20, where Jesus says, go and tell my brothers and say to them, I'm ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. And Akuri notes that this is the first time in John's Gospel where the disciples are told that the father of Jesus to be their father, is to be their father too. Previously, father, only Jesus seems to relate to God as father. Now they're told, the disciples are told, that God is their father too. The Last Supper they named as friends, not slaves, but now they're told they share the same parent in God. They are in truth brothers and sisters of Jesus in God in much the same way Curry says that children are related who have the same mother and father. This revelation of a new family, Curry suggests, takes us back to the Johannine prologue, where all believers are referred to not only as the children of God, but as being born of God. And that such a birth as Nicodemus is told in John 3, he must make to have new life. A birth brought about, Curry says, by Christ's passion, death, and resurrection. The commission to Mary Magdalene is not only to testify to the resurrection, but to a new family, a new kinship established amongst the followers of Jesus. Jesus' words to Mary, my God, and your God, echo precisely the words of Ruth and Naomi at that juncture where the demands of patrilineage are put aside in favor of a family bond by faith. Now, I think the Curry's Conclusions are interesting in their own right, and all the more so from an African scholar who emphasizes in this wonderful piece her own understanding of, that her own African understanding of blood, kin, and birth make these Johannine associations especially resonant for her. The blood of kinship, she says, is the blood of ancestors and ancestresses who are always alive. And if this is true of human blood, she continues, should it not be more so of the blood of Christ, 
which has given birth and life to us as children of God and which continues to nourish us today through the Eucharist. Theologically, then, we need to consider the possibility that these central kinship titles in the New Testament make ontological claims. Those who receive Christ, who are baptized into his death and receive his body and blood, are a new family, not symbolically, but actually. That certainly has been one traditional understanding, that death is a real death and the life is a new life into a new kin of Christ. Now, our English word kind um, is today rather a weak word, indicating a pleasant manner. She has a kind face. But with its Germanic roots, the words kind and kin are the same. So to say in medieval uh, writings that Christ is our kind Lord is not to say he's gentle and mild, but to say that he is of our kin, he is of our kind. This fact and not emotional disposition is the rock of our salvation. Jesus isn't just nice to us, he is our kin, we are his kin. Now kinship may seem in our egalitarian times to be a dangerous direction, not least if we associate all kin titles with dominance and subordination. And without a doubt, kinship terms have been used in the past to reinforce a, reinforce a rigidity in Christian anthropology. Uh, but if we return, I think, to the text of scripture and some classical texts of theology, these fears may be dispelled. For instance, the hierarchical expectations of fathers and sons are completely overturned in the response of Gregory of Nyssa to Eunomius. Um, that was a mistake. The subordinationism based on kinship terms was Eunomius' mistake. In Matthew's Gospel, Jesus explodes normal expectations by asking, who is my mother, who are my brothers? With Christianity today so associated with affirming the importance of marriage, it's easy to forget that the early Christians were scandalizing antique society by foregoing marriage and choosing to be celibates and members of a new family of brothers and sisters in Christ. This was an offensive break with blood kinship, and it was affected by baptism. And what Michael Banner has described in a recent book is an unkinning in order to rekin us in the believers in Christ. Banner's book, The Ethics of Everyday Life, which draws extensively on the work of social anthropologists, um, points out that the writings of the New Testament privilege spiritual kinship over what we might now call natural and biological kinship. The Church of Israel is the promise of not of blood. The Church is the, uh, is the Israel of promise, not of blood. And the brothers, mothers, and sisters of Christ are those who build the will of God. And Banner continues, especially in the rite of baptism, and particularly the role taken by godparents, Christianity scripted a practice with preferred kinship that is made over kinship that is given. I think this is, it has, could have a slightly banner verges on the tab on superstitionism here, but I think we could say the people of Israel remain the kin of blood, and we are the kinship that is achieved, that is given. In the medieval church, godparents played a central role, and in many places, parents were apparently forbidden to be present at the baptism as a means of underscoring the new family into which the baptized now entered. This is very far, I need to say, from contemporary European practice where in many places godparents are an occasional pleasantry for the day of the ceremony only. We may have lost this deep sense of a new birth and a new kin. So what about this today? Is every human being a brother, or potentially so? What is it to do the will of God? Do non-Christians do it? Does the faithful Hindu do the will of God? When Jesus says in Matthew, um, Anyone who does the will of God is my brother and sister. Does this include all rightly intentioned people? A Christian theological approach to this, and it's not one that's going to be completely hammered up today, is one I think that needs to avoid the cheap fraternity of enlightenment <coughs> deism, a watered down civic religion of the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man, rubrics of Robespierre that became fashionable in the French Revolution and, for that matter, the American Revolution pendant upon it, where Father of God and Brotherhood of Man have been, until recently, accepted like motherhood and apple pie. Um, we need to retain the particularity of the Son of God as the one through whom all become firstborn sons. In the scriptural text, Jesus is not only Son, but the beloved Son. And if in the New Testament it is Jesus who names God Father, it is the Father who names Jesus as the beloved Son, decisively, 
at the baptism and the transfiguration. Now, instances of divine self-naming are extremely infrequent in the Hebrew Bible and very much prized by Jewish scholars um, and the rabbis. Most occur in the book of Exodus, famously where Moses addressed by, from the burning bush is uh, given the name, the holy name, the Tetragrammaton. But in the New Testament, the baptism and transfiguration are also instances of divine self-naming in Christian terms. It is the Father who names the Son, Son, and it is the Son who names the Father, Father. And that is why these kinship titles are not just other metaphorical titles amongst a raft of similar, like rock and fortress and high tower. The fatherhood of God is the fatherhood after which all fatherhood on earth is named was a point made both variously by Karl Barth and Thomas Aquinas. Jesus, as the beloved son, stands in a lineage of prophecy and fulfillment, a theme which is beautifully traced by the Orthodox scholar John Levinson in his book Death and Resurrection of the Beloved Son. He starts with the uh, um, biblical text and goes right up into the Christian period. It's very interesting from an Orthodox Jew. The beloved son is associated with the firstborn son, and there's a link to chosenness. In the Exodus narrative, the firstborn son somehow belonged to God. In Exodus 4, Moses is instructed by the Lord to say to Pharaoh, Israel is my firstborn son, an incident recalled by Hosea and, and other places, and of course in Christian liturgy. It is not surprising that the language of son and firstborn should come to be applied to Israel. But the beloved son is, as we all know, not always the firstborn. Isaac, perhaps the most significant beloved son of Torah, is not the firstborn of Abraham. And when Isaac himself becomes a father, it was not Esau, firstborn of his twins, but Jacob on whom God's favor rested. It seems to me that God can choose a son of promise against all human custom. Repeatedly, the firstborn or chosen one is subjected to humiliation, even brought near to extinction before being exalted and delivered. It is the younger son, the beloved son Isaac, who in Genesis is taken by Abraham to be sacrificed on Mount Moriah. This is the preeminent son of promise, the one through whom all nations will be blessed. Thus, the lineage of the beloved son, which is declared from the voice from heaven at the baptism and transfiguration, is this lineage. It's through this beloved son, through his death and resurrection, through drinking his blood and eating his flesh, that each and every Christian becomes a firstborn son enrolled as citizens of heaven. This, in Catholic theology, is an ontological claim, affirmation of real presence in an ontological term. What then of brothers? Um, I think this whole question of a new family is very um, important and interesting, and I want to draw on a, another paper that was given at the Strasbourg conference by a French theologian called Michel Dujarrier, which I, who I hadn't heard of before. He's a patristic scholar who's taught in Benin for over 20 years, a priest, and he's really working specifically on this type of brother in the early church. And amongst the French speakers, he was a really important influence because what he's discovered is that the name Brotherhood, uh, or Delphatoi, was the proper name of the church in its first three centuries. The name Ecclesia was just used to generically um, indicate any kind of assembly of people, assembly of people, civic or whatever. But when the writers are talking specifically about a group of Christians, they use this term, um, this uh, Adelphatoi. So he's, he's written two big books on this that are published by Sir. And he points out that um, in Greek, prior to the New Testament period, uh, you used Philadelphia um, for familial love, uh, but philanthropia, philanthropia for love of human, humankind. But the love of what you don't get is what you get in the Christian writings from um, the earliest times that he's traced it from circa 95 in 1 Peter and in Clement, Adelphicoids. And consistently, the Christian groups are named as, we, I wish we had a different term, we could have brothers and sisters, this, this kinship group. And that term is not used to designate any other group, according to him, than Christian groups. So it's a coinage, it's a coinage of the Christian community, and it's that, not ecclesia, which is used to indicate the community of Christians. 
So this, he suggests, and uh, the theology develops around it of the theology of Christ, our brother, which he tracks 500 more years of it, um, is, uh, suggests both our adoption by Christ as brothers and sisters, but also our participation in Christ by entering into the kinship of God. So in this sense, I found an, an, an ally amongst this speaker there. Now, to conclude, what do we do now? What are brothers? Uh, can only fellow baptized Christians be brothers? Do we need to be exclusive? Or, by contrast, should everyone potentially be brothers and sisters? Does that mean that we just join hands with Robespierre and venerate at the altar of the Supreme Being? Um, brotherhood of God, Brotherhood of Man? I suggest that the choices are not binary. Brother is an analogical term and can be used in a number of ways. Men entering religious life become brothers of fellow Dominicans or sisters of fellow Dominicans, women sisters of fellow Dominicans and Benedictines without ceasing to be brothers and sisters of fellow Christians. Nyssa was able to advocate virginity and foregoing blood descendants in order to have new brothers and sisters while in the same time remaining a brother in both spirit and flesh to his biological system of crime. From the early days, the followers of Jesus seemed able to consider their fellow baptized as brothers and sisters in this strong sense and extend this to others. The um, Apology of Aristides, a second century text written, we believe, to be delivered to the Emperor Hadrian, speaks of Christians as persuading their servants, handmaids, and children to become Christians, and it says, when they have done so, they call them, without distinction, brethren. I think that probably be a Delft toy. I haven't had a chance to check the text. The text that goes on to say that when they find a stranger, they bring him to their dwellings and rejoice over him as a true brother. For they do not call brothers those who are after the flesh, but who are after the spirit and in God. It's not clear from the text whether the stranger here is a Christian or becomes one, but I, it is clear, I think, that these strangers are both men and women, and they all are welcomed into this one status. So should the title of brother be extended to all human beings, the theological justification, I think, should be not the charitable assumption that Jesus taught us to treat all people as brothers, sisters, and mothers. Uh, that's kind, and we should do that anyway. But the Christological argument that by his incarnation, death, and resurrection, God became of our kind and our kin, and that consequently we, and potentially all humanity and all flesh in promer promise and futurity have become the kin in Christ. It is by participating in Christ that we are made one with another. Thank you. So I hope you've had a chance to jot down some questions as we move straight on to our next speaker. As he puts on his mic, I'll introduce him. Um, we have Professor Gerard Loughlin, who is a professor here in the Department of Theology and Religion at Durham. Much of his work over the past decade has spoken into and challenged the way in which we perceive theology as a discipline, particularly as it relates to gender and sexuality. He is the author of Alien Sex, The Body and Desire in Cinema and Theology. He's the editor of Queer Theology, Rethinking the Western Body, and co-editor of the journal Theology and Sexuality. His paper today is entitled Gender Ideology for a Third Sex Without Reserve. I'll just do the inevitable uh, question, can you hear me at the back? My I'm just going to launch straight into this paper without uh, any uh, introduction to it. So where better than the Catholic Church for learning how to be queer? Elizabeth Stewart has said that she first learned the instabilities of gender from living in a world where men wore frocks and women the names of male saints. Quote, Growing up surrounded by men wearing clothes, society labelled feminine, whom I had to relate to as father, taught by women who were my sisters or mothers, with names such as Augustine and Bernard Joseph, taught me that societal, societal categories were not fixed. They could be played around with, and that the church was a space in which gender shifted." End quote. In such a space, 
you already knew, if only unconsciously, about the difference between sex and gender, the biological and the social, and the fragility of their connection. Girls could have boys' names, and, though this is less common in Britain than elsewhere, boys could have girls' names. At the same time, of course, the church decried any departure from what we now call, or some of us now call, heteronormativity, a decrial that was often the work of those who had embraced, with varying degrees of enthusiasm, a celibate lifestyle, those who had become eunuchs for the kingdom. The lack of fixity between gendered names and sex bodies is an example of gender fluidity, an example of what many describe, deride, as gender ideology or gender theory. Of course, the latter is more than an observation, though it certainly starts from such or includes it. Gender theory is also an advocacy, or so it seems to those who decry it, those who think it a distortion of what they see as immutable givens. One might think the naming of gender ideology an ecclesial success story. Since Gillian Kane, writing recently in The Guardian, traces the origin of the term to the Vatican in the mid-1990s, to a time, she writes, when sexual and reproductive rights were formally recognised by the UN and when gender entered the lexicon of the global body. But for Kane, gender ideology is an illegitimate term. She describes it as a catch-all phrase to sell a false narrative and justify discrimination against women and LGBT people. And in this, she is not wrong. If the Vatican in the mid-1990s saw the deployment of gender in the UN and elsewhere as a cover for homosexuality, then its attack on gender ideology was an expression of its homophobia. So in this paper, I want to first sketch the nature of gender ideology as presented in various Vatican documents before turning to consider some of the givens it must overlook. These givens are what I am here calling the third bodies of the intersexed, the homosexual, and the transgendered, though I shall chiefly pay attention to the first of these, the intersexed, those once named as hermaphrodite or androgyne. I then want to indicate how Vatican gender ideology threatens not only women and LGBTI people, but the church also, in some of its core doctrines and practices. Finally, I want to briefly suggest how we might think to undo this gender ideology. The expositions will become ever briefer the thinking less diaphanous as we reach the end of the paper. In 2016, Pope Francis, in his exhortation on the joy of love, warned of the challenge posed by, and I'm quoting him, various forms of an ideology of gender that denies the difference and reciprocity in nature of a man and a woman, and envisages a society without sexual difference thereby eliminating the anthropological basis of the family. This ideology, the Pope continues, leads to educational programs and legislative enactments that promote personal identity and emotional intimacy radically separated from the biological difference between male and female. Consequently, human identity becomes the choice of the individual one which can also change over time, end quote. Now in that, Francis was quoting from the final report of the 14th Ordinary General Assembly of the Synod of Bishops, the Synod on the Family of 2015. And it may be noted that the Pope also repeated the report's acknowledgement of the difference between sex and gender, but with its caveat that they can be distinguished but not separated. The Pope's reference to gender ideology is as clear as any to be found elsewhere in Vatican teaching. 
It gestures towards unnamed thinkers, unnamed texts, to discourses that assail the fixity of sexual difference, while promoting a fluidity that would allow people to think and rethink their gender for themselves. It echoes earlier pronouncements such as the following from Joseph Cardinal Ratzinger in 2004. In a letter to the bishops of the Catholic Church on the collaboration of men and women in the church and in the world, the cardinal, as he was then, noted that in the perspective of gender ideology, quote, physical difference, termed sex, is minimized, while the purely cultural element, termed gender, is emphasized to the maximum and held to be primary. <coughs> the obscuring of the difference or duality of the sexes has enormous consequences on a variety of levels. This theory of the human person intended to promote prospects for equality of women through liberation from biological determinism has in reality inspired ideologies which, for example, call into question the family in its natural two-parent structure of mother and father and make homosexuality and heterosexuality virtually equivalent in a new model of polymorphous sexuality. So again, no actual texts are named, no names given, the accused must volunteer themselves. And why are their views described as ideological? That too is undetermined. But for the most part, Vatican documents use the term ideology as a slur. It marks a hostility toward the teaching of the Church, as that is understood within the Vatican. It also works rhetorically to obscure the fact that the Vatican position is itself ideological. And by that, I don't just mean that the Vatican's teaching is itself a hostility, though it is one. I also want to suggest that it is a teaching which pretends to a universality it doesn't have, and does so in order to obscure its particularity, which is a particularity that precisely refuses to acknowledge certain facts, certain givens that it must ignore in order to misrepresent the world, in order to say that which is not. And it's precisely the refusal of reality that renders it ideological and permanently unstable, in need of constant repetition against the real. This is why there is a hermeneutic continuity, a constant policing of discourse within the Vatican idiosphere, to borrow a term from Roland Barthes. And so I move to my chief exhibit of Vatican gender ideology, which will be familiar to some of you, I'm sure. Unlike his own theology of the body, the theology of the body contained in Genesis is, John Paul II tells us, concise and sparing with words. <laughs> yet, this is not John Paul now, yet it merits extensive commentary because its contents are in some sense fundamental, primary, and definitive. Quote, all human beings find themselves in their own way in that biblical knowledge. End quote. It is the knowledge of the difference between man and woman, a difference which is captured almost entirely in the woman's maternity. Quoting John Paul again, the difference is shown only in a limited measure on the outside, in the build and form of her body. Motherhood shows this constitution from within as a particular power of the feminine organism. End quote. Yet in regard to Genesis, we might think that John Paul is an unreliable narrator. John Paul II repeatedly introduces a reciprocity into Genesis that, I suggest, is not there. Man, we are told by the Pope, has been created as a particular value before God, but also as a particular value for man himself. First, because he is man. Second, because the woman is for the man, and vice versa, the man for the woman. But in Genesis, 
Eve is made for Adam, not Adam for Eve. As St. Paul knew when he noted that, quote, man was not made from woman, but woman from man. Neither was man created for the sake of woman, but woman for the sake of man. Eve is made in order to bear Adam's children, which Paul notes when he goes on to say that now man comes through woman. And which John Paul recalls when he remembers that no matter how alike or mutual man and woman, they are also entirely different. Though this again is contrary to Genesis. John Paul tells us that, quote, woman's constitution differs from that of man. In fact, we know today that it is different even in the deepest biophysiological determinants, end quote. But of course, this is precisely what we don't know today. At the end of the 19th century, Sir Patrick Geddes, uh, uh, an Edinburgh physician, could argue that males were composed of catabolic cells that paid out energy, while females were made of anabolic cells that conserved energy. But his view was well gone by the end of the 20th century. And now we are told by modern genetics that there is very little difference between people. We differ by only 60 out of 30,000 genes. So now is the time to introduce the third. The third in John Paul's theology of the body is the child, that in which the man and the woman know each other reciprocally. But this third is but a repetition of the two, or one of the two, as male or female. So I want to introduce a more radical third that calls into question the duality at the heart of the complementarian ideology espoused in papal Vatican teaching. This is the non-spousal third sex that is neither male nor female. This third sex is here and at first a conflation of two different kinds of contradiction, both of which Vatican gender ideology must either ignore or deny, and which it denies through ignoring. The first contradiction of the body, sorry, the first contradiction is the body that, though male or female, is not spousal in John Paul's sense, not ordered to heterosexual bonding. I'll say a little about this body, except when noting its conflation with the second contradiction, which more directly disconfirms papal ideology. This second third is the intersexed body, the body that rebukes John Paul's insistence that human being is created either male or female. Male and female created he them. Not all bodies, not all people, are born male or female. A significant number are born between these two sexes, except that their arrival calls into question the idea of a singular male or female identity, a pure masculinity or femininity. No such things exist. There are merely performances of such ideas. Those who are now said to be intersexed were once known by other names, classically as hermaphrodites or androgynes, and biblically, perhaps, as eunuchs. Perhaps because a eunuch is commonly understood as a male deprived of his sex, either by his own or another's hand, as in Jesus' reference to such in Matthew. But Jesus also mentions those who are eunuchs from birth, and so many people, such as uh, Megan de Franza, in her recent study of sex difference in Christian theology, takes this as referring to those otherwise named as hermaphrodites in ancient literature. However that may be, these names both reveal and obscure. They reveal that there were, that there have always been, intersex people. But the nature of their intersexuality is hidden. We cannot read back onto their bodies any of the several conditions now named as intersex, whether hypospadia, various forms of congenital adrenal hyperplasia, varying effects of androgen and sensitivity syndrome, chromosomal variations, and what today is considered true hermaphrodism, 
the presence in one person of both testicular and ovarian tissues, a trait that's rare in our species, but common in others. Given the differences, it is perhaps misleading to think of the intersex as a third sex between two others. At best, the idea of a third sex is a placeholder for the complexity of human embodiment. As earlier noted, the third sex was often a way of referring to those who would become known as homosexuals, but who were early thought of as combining both sexes, as men within women's bodies, women within men's. This is neatly caught in Michel Foucault's description of 19th century homosexuality as, quote, an interior androgyny, a hermaphrodism of the soul. We may trace a separating of these two kinds of third, of homosexuality and intersexuality, but if doing so, we should note that early, if not later on, the fear of one was the detestation of the other, that a person might get away with homosexuality <coughs> under cover of intersexuality, though these were not the terms or concepts employed. Foucault details how, in 17th century France, people ceased to be executed simply for being hermaphrodites, and instead were offered the choice of becoming one or other sex, of living as either a man or a woman. Problems arose, however, if, having chosen one sex, they then used their other to enter into what we would call a homosexual relationship. This happened with one hermaphrodite who, having become a man, then had sex with another man, and having been discovered in this, was burnt alive. A happier case from 1601 is of a Maria who, having become Martin, lived with a woman, but on being found to have no manhood about him, was sentenced to burn. But on appeal, while still judged to be a woman, was ordered to live as such, chastely. Foucault finds this significant as the first case uh, to involve a proper clinical diagnosis and for the explicit naming of the hermaphrodite as monster. A similar story comes from 1765, uh, towards the end of the 18th century, in which Anne Grandjean, who, on finding herself attracted to girls, decided to live as a boy, moved to Lyon and married Francois Lambert. Being exposed, she was convicted of having lived with a woman and sentenced to the pillory. But on appeal, her case was dismissed, but with the requirement to live as a woman without entering into any further intimacies with women. Foucault's interest in this second case, at the end of the 18th century, is that the medical testimony rejects the idea of the monstrous hermaphrodite as a mixture of two sexes, and instead proposes that there are only those with defective genitalia that render them infertile. Now, uh, Foucault writes, now there are only eccentricities, kinds of imperfection, errors of nature. And this, Foucault continues, allows for a new kind of monstrosity to emerge in the 19th century, which is a monstrosity of character. It is a shift, he says, from the juridico-natural to the juridico-moral, a monstrosity of conduct rather than the monstrosity of nature. It is the monstrosity of homosexuality, to be named as such later in the 19th century. So Foucault finds that in different times, different figures have been found monstrous. First, the person who is both human and animal. Second, the conjoined twin, who is both one and two. And finally, in the 18th century, the hermaphrodite, who is both male and female. In all these cases, the monstrosity is that of the third, the one who crosses the divide between two separate domains, something that is contrary to nature and, more decisively, contrary to conventional and legal categories, people the law cannot accommodate. These cases, or at least Foucault's reading of them, suggests both the conjunction of hermaphrodite and homosexual as monstrous thirds, and that even as the site of monstrosity shifts from one to the other, from the hermaphrodism of the body to that of the soul, 
there remains the need to eliminate such thirds, to secure the realm of the two, the simple dualism of sex. And it is this that we see replayed in the body theology of John Paul II, which is very much a theology of the 19th century. A third third, to which I am paying even less attention, is the transgendered person who chooses to change his or her gender to either the opposite of that given or to settle between as they rather than he or she. Yet it is this further contradiction that gives rise to one of several ironies, for it is the case that many of those who abhor the idea of changing gender are yet willing to have the intersex changed, often without their consent, undertaken when they are too young to know, let alone resist what has been done to their bodies. In the 18th century, the discovered hermaphrodite was forced to choose one sex or the other, male or female, and did so by adopting the clothing and possible occupations of their chosen sex, their amorous relationships accordingly limited as well. A similar choice was forced upon people in the 20th century, and still in the 21st, but now advances in medical science mean that it is not only their clothing that can be changed, but their bodies also, subject to surgical interventions that will conform them to one sex or the other. This starts in childhood, and so the people making the choice are most often the parents of the intersex under the guidance of doctors, and not the intersex themselves. But the, professor, sorry, the pressure to conform to a dimorphic world is the same as in the 18th century. Everyone is made to fit the ideology of Genesis 1.27. Tolerance for such interventions, while abjuring transgender operations, is perhaps explained by the fact that conforming the intersex to male or female is forced upon them. It's not a willful change on their part, and so not the monstrosity of self-direction, the refusal of instruction, when human identity becomes the choice of the individual, one which can also change over time, the horror expressed in my earlier quotation from Pope Francis. I've noted how John Paul II discovers a mutuality between Adam and Eve in Genesis that is not there, while at the same time he also finds a vast difference between man and woman, which again is not present. John Paul II is firmly wedded to a 19th century dualistic understanding of the human body that is almost the exact opposite of that which is in Genesis. Thus we must distinguish between what I have called the ideology of Genesis 127 and Genesis itself, where the derivation and so the continuity of Eve from Adam is much more open to the third precisely because it is not committed to the two. But in order to think this notion of the body as a continuum, I want to introduce a further dualism which is that between what Thomas Lecoeur describes as the one-sex body of the ancient world and the two-sex body of modernity. This dualism has recently been taken up by the Anglican theologian Adrian Thatcher in order to redeem gender. Lecoeur proposes that sex as we know it was invented at some point in the 18th century. By sex, he means the distinction between man and woman as a division between two very different kinds of body, suited for very different kinds of occupation. I've already uh, suggested the division between male and female in John Paul II. Lecoeur contrasts this modern view with that of a more ancient one, which thought there is really only one kind of body, of which male and female are variants, inversions of one another. Male genitals are on the outside, and female on the inside, but otherwise they are the same, with both producing seed, which, when mixed, produces males or females, depending on the relative heat of each, on the temperature, as it were, of the mixture. Lecoeur's chief exponent of the, this view is the second century physician Galen, whose text remained 
influential throughout the medieval period and into the early modern. Thatcher considers some of the criticisms that have been made of Lecoeur's work, not least as marshaled by Helen King, but judges, rightly I think, that the basic thesis stands up. The one-sex model was operative in much ancient thought. We see something like it in the opening chapters of Genesis, and aspects of it persist, but from the 17th century onwards, a little earlier than Lacour's initial 18th century dating. A two-sex model gains currency uh, in the modern period, and even if there are forerunners of such an idea, it gains a new authority from a newly emerging, empirically-based medical science that by the 19th century has usurped any previous authorities, not least the theological. Thatcher's interest is to consider the current gender trouble in the churches once it is acknowledged that much earlier Christian thought was informed by the one-sex model, a formation that is lost to view when a modern two-sex model is projected back onto earlier texts and arguments. Thus, when woman was but an inversion of man, albeit a cooler, weaker version, there need be no worry that she was part of the flesh, redeemed through the incarnation. Little question that the hotter, stronger, more perfect version of the human should represent Christ at the altar. But once a two-sex model predominates, these conclusions become doubtful. Is woman really included in Christ? if she is now so very different from man, such that there is an abyss between her and him, as Angelo Cardin Scola averts. Vatican teaching, according to Thatcher, posits, quote, two human natures, male nature and female nature, which are absolutely different. It follows that intersex, third sex, and transgender people are officially made to vanish. They are not fully human. But also vanishing, later, if not yet, are women. For when there are two natures, male and female, the male Christ, Thatcher argues, has no female nature. Female nature is not assumed by the world. Thatcher thinks that this endangering of both Christology and soteriology derives from the unrecognized mixing of both one sex and two sex theories of human being. He traces it in both ecclesial documents and in the thought of influential theologians, such as Karl Barth and the inevitable Hanserz von Balthasar, whose theology Thatcher judges to be immoral. We might wonder if Thatcher has not overread someone like John Paul II, overread the distinction between male and female as two natures, but indeed, John Paul does present sexual difference as an ontological difference, and in doing so, threatens the salvation of women. A similar concern is expressed by Megan de Franza, who notes that John Paul's enthusiasm for the spousal meaning, heterosexual orientation of the body as the Imago Dei, threatens the humanity of those who have no such orientation. She is thinking of the intersexed, those without a clear masculinity or femininity, and who would, she says, at best know only a distorted view of love and at worst be placed outside the possibility of love." End quote. They would, in fact, be placed outside the human, alongside the homosexuals. De Franza also notes the problems that heterosexual spousality poses for non-vowed celibates. Vowed celibates such as John Paul himself, are deemed by John Paul to be within the spousal matrix because married to Christ. Though this might put male vowed celibates, such as John Paul himself, back outside, since married to a man, even if only phantasmally. So, in conclusion, the church does not have to think that heterosexual spousality or nuptiality is the mark of the Imago Dei. This is a recent modern development. It is of a piece with the modern idea of sexual difference as a fundamental ontological difference, understanding male and female as the only possibilities for human being. All non-conforming beings, those who are third to the duality of the two, 
are excised from the realm of the human, unless somehow changed, reconstructed, made fit. And again, and of course, the church does not have to accept this understanding of sexual difference. It is not there in Genesis. In Genesis, Adam and Eve are one flesh. And this, of course, is how Adrian Thatcher proposes to redeem gender, to find it but secondary to the humanity in which the word became incarnate. We do not have to ontologize masculinity and femininity, male and female. We do not have to turn them into idols. We can think beyond or before sexual difference. We can remember that when Adam and Eve came out of the garden, they discovered a world already full of people, that they were not the only two. They discovered the third, waiting to meet them. Sufficiently stretched. Thank you, um, Gerard. So, our last speaker um, this morning is Reverend Dr. James Allison, who is a Catholic priest, theologian, and author. He works as an itinerant preacher, lecturer, and also guides retreats. And can people hear me without this if I'm speaking loudly? In his own words, James has firmly but gently faced down the church authority on matters gay and lived to tell the tale. No mean feat, I suggest. When not on the road, he lives in Madrid and we're grateful to him today for being willing to leave warmer climes, although not so bad today, to contribute to our conference. And this morning he speaks on My Sheep Hear My Voice and I Know Them. Reflections on language, tone and teaching in the space between magister and magisterium. What does it mean to be taught by Christ? <coughs> Genuinely to undergo being taught by him. So that any one of us could say, after reflective consideration, I've learned this or that from Christ. Or others could pick one or several of us out and say, they are who they are because they have been taught by Christ. Until quite recently, it would have been thought that there were a couple of more or less obvious answers to the question. Well, we undergo being taught by Christ by reading the scriptures, hearing what Christ has to say, and learning how to put that into practice. Not a bad answer, <clears throat> for there are indeed to be found in the text lapidary phrases and unforgettable stories, words which will last forever. However, as an answer, it's become more challenging to maintain as we've learned more about how ancient texts work, how easy it is to be fooled into ignoring <laughs> That it is our own reflection that we see first in such texts. We've been given some spared examples by Jared just now. And how difficult it is to allow those texts to break through that reflection and to read us. In other words, any easy wholeheartedness in our reply is suspect, as reflecting naive idealism and perhaps the ideology of a group that's forming us rather than lived discipleship. Another answer might have been, well, we undergo being taught by Christ through submitting ourselves to the teaching of the church, especially as conveyed to us by bishops in communion with the Bishop of Rome. Again, not a bad answer, for without some sort of living institutional interpretative mechanism, we would be a religion of the book and not the religion of spirit and of signs which we are. However, a number of factors, lived factors, in the biographies of all of us, have made it challenging to give this answer in other than a highly nuanced way, if again, our reply is not to be suspect as revealing naive idealism or a group's ideology rather than lived discipleship. 
Let me say that when I refer to lived factors in the biographies of all of us, I don't mean in the first place particular teachings on, for instance, contraception, matters gay, the death penalty, or ecological and financial issues, though each one of these may have served for some of us as a way into what I'm talking about. I mean that over the lifetime of, I guess, all of us here, something other than the official living interpretative mechanism has taught us, and taught us truly, to become ever more aware of the persistent dishonesty, sanctified cowardice, corporate spirit, intellectual <coughs> bankruptcy, moral opportunism, financial ineptness, sexual furtiveness, vacuous careerism, and liturgical idiocy, which sometimes seem to inhere in the clerical caste of our church, in precisely the group which attributes to itself, at least in its upwardly mobile members, the role of magisterium. Now, please note, my aim here is not to bore or to scandalize with criticisms of the clerical caste, of which I am one. My interest is elsewhere. I take it for granted that none of those present can pretend or want to pretend to be members of some putative simple faithful, that if we are here in Durham for this celebration today, it's because we've not allowed ourselves to be scandalized by the manifest non-credibleness of our own setup, but are aware of something more than, something other than our shared structured mess as at work in keeping the gospel alive in our midst and in enabling us to be taught by Jesus. Moreover, we are aware that this something more than is in some sense of Christ and from Christ and is not diminished by the obvious diminishment of those whose claim to stand for him has come to ring so hollow. I consider then that to be able to bring out, explicate, and explore with tentative rationality how we really have been taught and are in fact being taught by Christ in the midst of all this is part of a positive exercise in sharing our responsibility for transmitting the gospel in and as church. In short, I want to bring out into sharper relief something to which Vatican II pointed but to which we haven't yet given as much attention as we might. <clears throat> in its tenth paragraph, Dave Urban famously says this, quote, sacred tradition and sacred scripture form one sacred deposit of the word of God committed to the church. Holding fast to this deposit, the entire holy people united with their shepherds remain always steadfast in the teaching of the apostles, in the common life, in the breaking of the bread, and in prayers. <clears throat> so that holding to practicing and professing the heritage of the faith, it becomes, on the part of the bishops and faithful, a single common effort. Jerry, when I have my water, <coughs> that's your water. Yeah, mine is behind the road, yes. <laughs> Next paragraph. But the task of authentically interpreting the word of God, whether written or handed on, has been entrusted exclusively to the living teaching office of the church, whose authority is exercised in the name of Jesus Christ. This teaching office is not above the word of God, but serves it. That's the line I want you to remember. This teaching office is not above the word of God, but serves it, teaching only what has been handed on, listening to it devoutly, guarding it scrupulously, and explaining it faithfully in accord with the divine commission and with the help of the Holy Spirit. It draws from this one deposit of faith everything which it presents for belief as divinely revealed. Okay, it's that last sentence to which I wish to pay heed, for there is in it an initial, ref an initial reference to something which cannot be contained. This teaching office is not above the word of God, but serves it. Before the authors move on to expounding how they consider themselves to be the officially trustworthy servants of that uncontainable. That reference to the uncontainable may have been a rhetorical salute 
alluding to the traditional Protestant criticism of Catholic teaching authority as in some way usurping the place of the word of God. But it's certainly not merely a rhetorical salute. And it does leave something to be fleshed out, which to my awareness has not been fleshed out, or at least has not been fleshed out with anything like the same detail, not to say canonical obsessiveness and self-referential emphasis, that the rest of the paragraph that surrounds it has been subjected to. Of course, the word of God, this teaching office is not above the word of God but serves it, the word of God to which the paragraph refers is the written or handed on word of God. That is to say, only by analogy, the word of God. For the word of God, simpliciter, is the crucified and risen Jesus. And it's curious that the authors of the document, in referring to themselves as the living teaching office of the church, exercising authority in the name of Jesus, talk as though the living presence of the word of God, simpliciter, were specifically associated with them as the real interpreters of written or spoken words which are somehow more than they. Well, all of that fits well enough within a cultural world whose assumptions about human rationality were buttressed by generations of what we might call, with a very grateful hat tip to Fergus Carr, Cartesian Thomism. The assumption was that the baptized faithful might have a certain knowledge of the faith, but that owing to original sin, from which we have been forgiven, but whose effects are still rampantly alive within us, we are unlikely to be able to achieve truth and understanding, clear knowledge, above all in matters where fleshly passions render humans extremely prone to self-deception. However, luckily, rather as God delivers certainty to the Cartesian mind, despite its dependence on a body whose deliverances would always tend to the dubious, so church authority exercises the role of official recipient of divine certainty and rationality as the stand-in for Christ, the head of the body. While the rest of us are the more or less passion-prone body who can be rendered docile by obedience to the deliverances of the rational ecclesiastical mind. Familiar picture. Well, fairly obviously, it's this whole culturally dated way of understanding deliverances of truth in the midst of self-deceptive humanity that has collapsed across, culture, across our culture over the last century. The picture of rationality, I insist, rather than any of the theological truths that it thought it was sustaining. For those who enjoy irony, it would seem that while the body of the church has by and large got on with discipleship, learning with difficulty and no little humility about the objective nature of human subjectivity at relative peace with our corporal mutability, <coughs> the head has scarcely begun to perceive quite how subjective is its objectivity, how self-flattering, let alone how prone have been some of its clear and distinct deliverances to all the self-deception of original sin to which it appears to think itself immune. Again, we give some delicious examples. <laughs> in Jared's paper. Part of what the rest of us have learned, of course, is that relationality is prior to rationality, as both social science and neuroscience attest. It is as relational beings that we become rational, and that according to the quality of our relationality, so will be our rationality. From this perspective, it becomes apparent that there's something tremendously defensive and frightened about insisting that the mind is prior to desire. And fear and defensiveness have never been true allies of faith and truthfulness. So how are we going to reimagine what it means to be taught by Christ? As you can tell, I'm only just getting into this project and I'm unsure where, where it will take me. Nevertheless, when it comes to the question of the relationship between the living word of God, the magister, the master, the relationship between the living word of God, those who commend themselves to us as the magisterium, and the rest of us, then let us remember that what we're in search of <clears throat> is a renewed Catholic interpretation of these lines. You are not to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher, and you are all siblings. And no man your father, call no man your father on earth, for you have one father who is in heaven. 
neither be called guides or instructors, for you have one guide, the Christ. And here I'm very much on the territory of uh, the Genesis. I take it that three, these three negative instructions, which I've just read, function as a negative theology of teaching. Long before we can begin to say anything positive about Christ teaching us, we are severely warned about three tones of voice, the which, if we either use them themselves, either use them ourselves in our teaching, or hear them in others who claim to be teaching us, automatically exclude that which is being delivered as of Christ. And the three tones of voice are all symptoms of certain relationships within the cultural matrix we normally refer to as religious. So, to translate the word rabbi, whatever authorized religious specialists there are among us, which can include a good number of us here, the teaching Christ does not sound like any one of us. All biological and cultural forms of paternity are more likely to mislead us about than to point us toward God our Father. God's voice never sounds like that formed from within cultural paternity. Finally, any voice purporting to be from a guide or instructor, someone who's got their act together and so can lead others, is a siren voice of fake goodness and deluded self-mastery and is not the voice of the Christ who genuinely leads us on. This has been easier for us to remember since John Paul II's catastrophic 1994 commendation of Martial, Martial de Goyado as an efficacious guide for youth. That was the word guide in exactly the sense of the word forbidden by the Greek kathegetes in St. Matthew's Gospel. And Martial, some I remember, was a serial abuser of minors over decades, including several of his own children by three different wives, but also the most successful fundraiser in the history of the church and the founder of the Legionaries of Christ. Efficacious guide for youth with pontifical blessing. The oddest and apparently the most difficult of these negative instructions to receive seems to be the one about fathers. Again, here I'm repeating in slightly different language what we have already heard. There is a, an apparent crypto-bytheism by which we imagine the father as a center of consciousness and therefore of recognizably paternal attitudes and tones of his own, who has set up a created order which the son, another center of consciousness with a more filial set of attitudes, then comes into in order to sort out some sort of offensive mess. Well, in this way, we render null one of the most extraordinary things about the New Testament, which is that there is no paternal teaching voice in it at all. The only time there is a voice from heaven, a bath call, as Janet pointed out, it has as its purpose to transfer all representative power to the Son, with words to the effect of, this is my fully empowered equal, listen to him. So that there's no longer any divine paternal teaching. Teaching about the Father, yes, but not teaching from the Father. All the teaching is done at the level of an equal among equals, and tends to create equality among equals. This, I suspect, is the impact also of the famous phrases in Matthew's Gospel. You have heard, but I say to you. In each case, the relevant oracle has its apparent cultural paternity relativized, and a teaching that works at the level of reciprocal sibling desire is substituted for it. It's also part of the impact of the first phrase of the well-known hymn from Philippians, which we are, where we are told to have amongst ourselves the mind of Christ, who, though he was in the form of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. It's taken me a long time to begin to suspect that the grasping in question is not to be taken as opposed to letting go, rather as if it said, well, he had been grasping on to equality with God, but he let go, as one might let go of an upper railing of a particularly high skyscraper and so fell to earth as a human. Well, rather, the grasping refers to holding on to equality with God for himself exclusively, as opposed to willingly undergoing everything necessary to make of that equality with God something to be shared with us. 
I apologize for having so little advanced with this thought project, that of attempting to begin to provide some regular criteria for discernment for what it's actually like to undergo being taught by Christ. My hope eventually is that we be able to describe with confidence where we actually have learned from Christ. As a real biographical, where you could tell stories, which you say, yes, yes, I know that at that point I was the he taught by Christ. That we be able to protect ourselves from those whose tone and language make it quite clear that their teaching is not from Christ. And that we find an appropriate way to describe and to live the relationship between the living word of God, the magister in our midst, and the different gifts and commissions of entirely equal siblings in the body. In this way, whatever the term magisterium might turn out to mean within a quite different understanding of rationality, it will be evident that it has a proper role as a sign of how the one teacher is present in our building each other up for that dizzy equality. For the moment, I leave you with a thought. There's something slightly counterintuitive about the quote from John 10, 27, which is my title. Remember, I, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them. I would expect the phrase to be, and in fact, I misremembered it as, my sheep hear my voice, and they know me, or they recognize me. But in fact, Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them and they follow him. It would seem that part of what is recognizable in his tone of voice is that it communicates knowing them, such that they're able to pick up from his tone of voice that they are known as they are. In fact, there seems to be an interpenetrative quality, such that it is in our being known that we come to know him. And maybe this is the inseparable beginning to any answer about what it looks like to be taught by Christ. Any genuine following comes from within a sense of being known. A sense of safety, freedom, and enhanced wholeheartedness is the immediate correlate to the voice.